I like it spooky. Hey everybody, welcome to the I Like It Spooky Horror Podcast. I'm Brian. I'm Jason. I'm Clint. And this one time, I went to a costume party and I didn't dress up. I just had on this like orange poofy kind of vest thing. And everybody's like, why didn't you dress up? And I said, I did dress up. And they they said, no, you didn't. And I said, yes, I did. And it went back and forth. And then finally, I said, hey, have you ever seen the Great Pumpkin? And they're like, well, no. I was like, well, there you go. I'm the Great Pumpkin. That's my costume. <laughs> It's the Great Pumpkin, Charlie Brown. I was never invited back ever again. Well, what the hell did we do wrong? We invited you back. <laughs> <laughs> We're gluttons for punishment. I think it's because I send you guys all these news articles that you don't want to report on. So uh, let's let's get to some of them and see what they are. I'm super excited about this news article, even though it's like very early in everything. Trick or treat, you know, the Sam, the enforcer of Halloween rules. Um, There's a sequel coming out. I know that there's been talk about sequels for years with this movie on Bloody Disgusting. Just this morning, they dropped an article talking about the sequel is in very active development, according to Michael Doherty, which is the director, writer of, you know, Trick or Treat, Krampus. So I guess... During a Beyond Fest screening of the beloved horror movie, Doherty revealed that Trick or Treat 2 is in active development. So I don't know what that means. I'm excited for it, though, as long as there's something going on. Active development could even just be writing, early, early planning. Super excited for this to come. Kind of nervous, though, also, because I like Trick or Treat so much, and I'm worried they'll ruin it. But then, like I say with every Halloween movie, just keep putting them out. And if they're bad, they're bad. If not, at least we're getting more. So more excited than anything. Yeah, You know, I mean, anything can happen, but I, I I would bet that this, they won't ruin it. It's going to have the same director, right? And it's been, it's been years since the first one came out. How long has it been? Has it been 20 years? I can't remember how long it's been. It's been a while, but anyway, so it's not the ideas are going to be fresh. It's not like it's going to just try to capitalize on the same stuff. I I, I can't wait, but I'm I don't think Quinn Lord's going to play Sam anymore because you know when we met him at Flashback. I'm like I looked at him and said, "You're taller than me," and he says, "Well, you know, I was seven when I when I made that." So the original Trick or Treat was 2007, so 15 years. But they could do so much with a sequel. It could just be another night, another night of events happening and sam's just out there doing his thing just it's just so easy you know it could be none of the same characters except for sam out there enforcing the rules again it could be sam at a freaking quilting show and they're gonna get our money we're gonna pay to see it (laughs) just in the namesake alone so and spirit's gonna have tons of merchandise that's what i was gonna say i think active development means that spirit halloween is getting another line of trick-or-treat items <laughs> that's the first thing in development we have to have toys ready for spirit before we even write the fucking script for this movie <laughs> that's it I, I got my wallet ready active development also means it'll automatically become my favorite trick-or-treat because i love part twos of everything for some odd reason just a hocus pocus too and tiffany's like what did you think i was like I must say it now. That was better than the fucking first one. I don't care. (laughs) Just because of the number two? (laughs) Yeah, yep. (laughs) It was actually pretty good. I liked it too. Yep. I it wasn't better than it wasn't better than the first one, but I enjoyed it. I I don't I don't hate that movie at all. But you know what I think they're gonna do with that? And this is just one man's opinion, is they are going to turn that into a, a series on Disney. I mean, they, they passed the torch and they've got the, the young Disney cast now. And I see them turning that into a series. Of course, that'd be great. Well, if you want to come over and watch it 50 times a month, you you know where to go. <laughs> <laughs> so speaking of our friends at uh, Bloody Disgusting, again, this morning in the news, Treehouse of Horror presents Not It. <laughs> Simpsons launches Pennywise-themed costume, not costume contest, that'd be cool too, art contest. So the Simpsons is doing something a little different with their annual Treehouse of Horror episode this year. For the first time ever, airing two different brand new episodes. So the first one will be the Treehouse of Horror, the regular 
Um, and then there will be another full length 20 minute parody of Stephen King's It. So it sounds like they're doing like when Homer and his friends are younger, Pennywise will come to Kingfield, not Springfield, and they will fight Pennywise. <laughs> and then it'll go and flash forward to when they're older and they'll fight him again. Um, so they're also having fans do Krusty the Clown themed artwork and send it into them and they will show it during the episode. I um, mean, those will be airing October 23rd, uh, 2022 on Fox. Just sounds fun. And I think they had Krusty's name was Crusto. Just sounds fun. Something different. Pennywise and Krusty. And... Hell yeah. No, that's fantastic. I saw I saw the article and I didn't read much into it because I was like, oh, yeah, Treehouse of Horrors. But no, I'm super excited for that. I'm ready for that. Brian, I've always thought that your real genuine belly laugh Sounds just like Krusty the Clowns. <laughs> <laughs> that was that was just a taste. But if you guys are ever around Brian and you hear like his real, real laugh, his gut laugh, he is he is Krusty the Clown. You know, th- this is super cool. Um, the Simpsons have been around forever. They're, they're going to continue to be around forever. I'm curious what kind of uh, modern national news story, whether it's death or war or catastrophe, that they're going to prophesize in this uh, treehouse of terror. But we shall see. It's kind of weird that the Simpsons is covering a Stephen King thing. I'm sure they've done it in the past. I just don't remember it. But, uh, you know, we've talked about Stephen King prophesizing things on the show before the max the maximum overdrive episode the simpsons and stephen king they are modern uh nostradamus we got clint so i got a couple things you know i actually almost want to do a bonus episode i don't know if it's because it's spooky season and there's just so much great news um all across this wonderful genre of ours uh but i am picked a couple and real quick, I just want to say first that uh, Thomas Smith, the director of the Valentine Bluffs, uh, My Bloody Valentine fan film, has finally announced a release date. So Valentine Bluffs, a fan film, is set to release, this is a perfect date, February 14th, 2023. This coming Valentine's Day, we are going to get Valentine Bluffs, uh, My Bloody Valentine fan film. It's great. I'm sure it's going to be released on... Um, YouTube, you know, for free for everybody to see. There's going to be premiere parties and all that stuff, but uh, we'll keep you updated. We're all pretty uh, heavily invested into this film and have been waiting to see it for a while. Some of us literally more than others invested. (laughs) I kind of went down a rabbit hole when I got involved in this project and I kept going. And you know what was great about it, though, was um, it started off as a fan. They had some great perks that I purchased, some collectibles, uh, but then I've actually made some, some pretty cool relationships out of... Shit, actually, one of the reasons I'm on this podcast, the whole thing, it was that first time when I was at Midwest Monster Fest. I just typed in the Valentine Bluff group chat. I was like, is is anybody going to be here? I don't know where I'm at, and I'm all by myself. And Brian chimed. He says, I'm here. I live here. He wandered over and talked, and and here we are. So sorry, everybody. (laughs) Sorry about that one. But (laughs) So the other things I want to talk about was I came across some more video game news. BloodyDisgusting.com, which we like to talk about quite a bit. Dread XP announces video game adaptation of Creep Show. That's right, Creep Show is going to be getting a video game. Now, the article that I'm looking at, it doesn't go into too much detail other than that the game is going to maintain anthology format that we're used to with Creep Show. And that's pretty much it. I mean, there's no release date or anything like that. It's just like, hey, check it out. This Creep Show game's coming out. And the only thing I can think of is it's going to be like that game, The Quarry which I played a little bit and it's not necessarily, you know, it's more like a, it's like watching a movie and then you choose, choose which paths the actors go down. That, that's my guess. I don't know. Yeah, that'd be nice. That's a popular format. I know Walking Dead did that with a few games. Yeah, I've got one of those. I, f- I forget what it was called, but yeah, you choose whether to save the person or kill the person or, or stuff like that. And I, I could be dead wrong. It, it could be actual playable where you're running around bashing the, the zombie of Nathan Graham back into his grave. I, I don't know, but I will check it out. Right after I came across this article, I'm also um, on a, a creep show fan group on Facebook. And like so right after that, I came across this thing. This guy, his name is Stephen Snowden. It's, I mean, I don't know who he is. He's a member of the group, but he shared some pictures. And back in 2017, he made a mock-up packaging for a Creep Show Game Boy game. Do you guys remember Game Boy? Little handheld, you know, that was high technology than when we were kids. 
And it was based off Paperboy. I don't know if you guys remember Paperboy, but you know, you pedal along on your bike and you throw the papers at the houses. Oh, loved the it. The dogs were trying to chase you and stuff. And so he did this uh, this mock up. I wish I could share it with you guys. Oh, I'll figure out a way to share it. But the packaging looks really cool. But he even went as far as to do like a title screen, and it's got the Creep Show music in that like eight bit Nintendo format. It's it's super cool. The other video game news, and this is right up Jason's alley, is. Once again, bloodydisgusting.com, I found that Halloween Ends has Escape Michael Myers in fun new video game you can play online. Pretty sure this is available right now. And the game is simple. Your task is helping Laurie Strode outrun Michael Myers, avoiding obstacles and picking up weapons along the way. It's similar to many different web-based video games we've seen in recent years with a Halloween ends skin grafted onto it. So yeah, the screenshot I'm looking at in this article is terribly done 8-bit Laurie running from this terribly done 8-bit Michael. And they're running down the road. It says stage one. It's got a timer. But for, for any Halloween fan, or if you're just, I don't know, sitting in the bathroom or listening to this podcast and have some time to kill, then you can get online and play this game and run, run, run from Michael Myers. You haven't played it, Clint? <laughs> no. I barely have time to sleep half the time, so... <laughs> As soon as I heard about it, I got on it and I was like, I got to play this. I was actually sitting in the bathroom somewhere where I should be productive. <laughs> and I was like, oh, let me play this game. And you can't win the game. The, you're, the object is just to stay away from Michael as long as you can. And you just hit left, right, left, right, just to avoid stuff in the road. And it's actually fun. It's entertaining and it's free. Does it have like... Da, 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 in the background yeah that's cool it does is it is it like 8-bit soundy i don't know if it's 8-bit sounding or just normal sounding i guess i didn't pay that much attention but it does have that music you must have been busy multitasking in the bathroom it, well yeah yeah doing literally more than one thing at a time and i don't <laughs> <laughs> never mind that's uh, <laughs> he's ambidextrous folks ambidextrous hey so um you say it <laughs> so you say it keeps going is there like a score, like a high score? There is. As soon as you die, that shows the scoreboard. And then I don't know. I don't understand the scoreboard if it's minutes, but the number one thing, it says it's like 641. I was like, is that minutes? That's insane. I was like, the game hadn't even been out that long. So I, I feel it's like a developer or something. It's something weird. Are you able to see your scores compared to other people's or is it only your score? It's, it, it's weird. I don't think it tells you your score. It just shows you the board. So I don't know. Maybe you can scroll, but I haven't looked that hard into it because I haven't made it past a few minutes. I was asking because if, if you place a score on the board, I'm going to get on there and get one higher than you, but I'm going to put DMK. Nah, uh, yeah. yeah, jerk. I bet you will. I'm taking sixth place. God damn it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 641 minutes would be like six hours and 41 minutes, right? Or no, 10 hours. 10 hours. Yeah, there's no way in hell. Was it last year it come out too? Like every year it comes out, I feel like, about this time. Or I feel like I played something like it last year with you're running down the road trying to stay away from whoever's chasing you and there's like a frying pan, a chicken, a tree log, like in the middle of the road in town you have to like try to get weave through them and not get caught every time you fall down you slow down and michael gets closer i'm sure it's just cut and paste with different graphics you know kind of the same type of thing i think it'd be funny if there was an iron wasn't that one of the things that the townspeople in halloween kills was gonna <laughs> try to smoke michael with oh good god I, it does have a bad it does have a gun I don't know, maybe a hammer or something. But as you're going, you can you can pick up a weapon and then Michael like flashes red like and he you you can get away from him like for some time. Like if you hit him with enough weapons, the distance grows between you and him. But most of the game for me, he's like right on my ass. <laughs> I was just going to take everything you said and turn it into some potty humor, but I'm not going to. Uh, I'm, I'm stuck on the 641 because whether it's 641 minutes or 641 dollars, which is what I feel I spent on collectibles this week to make up for the last time where I didn't get anything. I think we need to get to Jason so he can tell us what's going on with our money. So, of course, you know, staple of our show, we have to talk about what we bought, why we're so poor, why we're spending all our money. 
and right now we are in prime season for all of our stuff. Spooky time. Stuff keeps coming out. I did pick up a few things. All right. So I had a birthday recently, so my family kind of got me some stuff, and it was kind of fun. My daughter picked up one of those, you know, the statues from Spirit Halloween. I know we joked about Spirit Halloween, but they had like the Sam statue, the Michael Myers statue thing. Uh, She bought me the Killer Clown statue. Um, with I forget which one he is, but he's bending over like saying "come here." But it's like a little, it's a little statue, and it lights up. It's really freaking cool. It's really heavy resin. You're looking confused, Clint. Have you not seen them? No, I, I haven't. No, I, so I was trying to like wrap my head around what you're talking about. I, I, I don't know if I don't think I've seen it. I'll share this on the socials also, but trying to show Clint here. It's like a nice little statue, and there's like lights on the base, and that it really glows. Yeah, that's that's blinding me right now. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, I don't think you know. I was just uh, I stopped in Spirit last night. Boots and I went and saw Smile. I didn't see that. I, I didn't know that existed. They keep coming out with so much killer clowns from outer space merchandise. It's really hard to keep up. I I love it though. Is it was I wanted it. I had already spent so much at Spirit, and I was trying to not get divorced. So <laughs> my my daughter surprised me with it. So that was awesome. Um, also uh, got some other gifts. The uh, uh, fright rags which i love they came out with some souvenir cup and i love all their stuff that they do the little merchandise like the souvenir cups makes me think of ones that you get like at the movie when you uh, she got me teen wolf and killer clowns which i love teen wolf st- too you know so uh got those got the some killer clowns from outer space pants from fright rags they're like pajama pants and they have a lot of like clowns on them with pink hair and they are very loud like looking so I put them on and I'm like, oh, I feel ridiculous. <laughs> like, cause that's not me. I'm, I'm like very tame, darker colors, not the stuff. So I, I put them on and I was wearing them around the house. My wife joked about it. She was like, you, you probably don't even want these. I'm like, no, I do. They're awesome. And then I put them on, started wearing them around. And my daughter came home and she was like, dad, can you come outside and help me? I got to go outside in these pants. <laughs> <laughs> I was worried. Of course, people were driving by as I'm walking outside. Nobody probably thought anything, but it was just not what I usually wear. But I love them. I'm going to rock them around the house. They always say that no one no one sees you at your worst quite like your local gas station or convenience store. You know, I want to see pictures <laughs> yes, of you walking yes, around yes. Walmart with those on. Oh, they'll be on the internet if you wear them around the Walmart. <laughs> <laughs> oh, right, right. Yeah. Look at this guy. Uh, a couple more things real quick. Rocky Horror Picture Show, of course, big this time of year, big always in my life. I've been trying to get all the autographs from the cast or, you know, the main cast. So I'm lucky enough to have a poster signed by Tim Curry. I took it last year. Was it last year or the year before and had it signed by Meatloaf before he passed? Well, of course, in Chicago, which I love that. And then I also have a Barry Bostwick autograph. But I found online a Susan Sarandon PSA authenticated autographed photo. I've always loved Susan Sarandon, always had like a little crush on her and picked up a autographed photo of her, you know, go towards my list of ever growing autos. And then the last thing I got is the Halloween. I got it in the mail yesterday. The Halloween. um, What is it? Six through resurrection set from Scream Factory. I think we talked about it before when it they announced it, but it finally came in and it's it's pretty nice. I'm glad to have that. And did you get that Walmart price? I did not. I ordered a couple of them from Walmart and they were canceled. Yeah, they they canceled. I think a couple of them eked out. If anybody listening doesn't know what I'm talking about, you know, from Scream Factory, I think this set was I don't know ninety bucks, a hundred bucks. I don't I don't know how much it was. But then they also sell through Walmart and Walmart posted them for like twenty two fifty, and people were eating that shit up and sharing it. And uh, some people I was reading the comments and they're like, don't worry, it's going to get canceled. And sure as shit, they came through and canceled it. But I saw that to, to soften the blows, Scream Factory offered some sort of like discount or free shipping or something to, to kind of make up for the confusion. They didn't offer me <laughs> shit. They were like, no, <laughs> here. They gave me my money back and that was it. (laughs) So, well, it kind of reminds me of like uh, when that Halloween or Ghostbusters box set came out when Afterlife was coming out, the box looked like a trap. Walmart had it one day for like 70 bucks when everybody else had it for like 125 to 150, somewhere around that. So I didn't know if it was a price error, but I ordered it on there and it, it came in. I mean, it wasn't like a huge discount like the others or like the Halloween was, but. 
I don't think they should be able to adjust that stuff. I learned at a young age when playing Monopoly, when you get that card that says bank air in your favor, you get the fucking money. There you go. And you were talking about Rocky Horror Picture Show. I just wanted to say real quick, uh, I think it's cool because Rocky Horror obviously still plays all across the nation. I wasn't a Susan Sarandon guy. I was a little Nell guy, that short red hair. But anyway, um, I just read that Barry Bostwick is going to be here in Michigan over by one of the suburbs of Detroit. They're putting on Rocky Horror Picture Show. And um, he's going to be like in attendance. I think it's to, you know, I'm sure you could probably get his autograph or whatever, but he's going to be in the audience watching the show. I thought that was cool. You know, people from the original movie traveling, traveling around and being part of the, the smaller productions that continue on with that. That's cool. I love that. Oh, that's my extensive list. What about you guys? I'm sure you all got something sweet. So let's see. First thing I picked up, I picked up a copy of Remind Magazine, and it's the Munsters issue. So our friend Justin Beam over at Red Rind Entertainment does a lot with Remind Magazine. A pretty cool throwback magazine, 70s, 60s, 70s, and 80s stuff. Trivia, puzzles, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, They also did some articles on horror hosts, Elvira, Vampira, Svengoolie, uh, Joe Bob Briggs, some local people too. We're lucky here to have a couple local people. Sven Gulli's local. He's from Chicago area. And then we also have a show called Midnight Mausoleum that's on Friday and Saturday nights that they're out of Clinton, Iowa, so they're close too. Um, so that was the first thing I picked up. Then I've already covered these on the YouTube channel, so go check that video out. But I got Vinegar Syndrome this month. I got The Iceman Cometh, Buried Alive, Mutant Hunt, and The Amityville Horror on 4K. All in slip covers and... Mutant Hunt looks cool on the front. It's got like a guy with a melting face and then he's on the ground and he's got like that stretch Armstrong like hand going out to like stop the guy from beating him to death. I was like, oh, that looks cool. Had a friend that went to the Winchester house in San Jose, I believe it is. It's a beautiful house, huge house, great architecture. The lady that um, built the house was the Winchester, the gun people, and she kind of felt like all of the people that were murdered with Winchester repeating rifles or weapons were going to come haunt her so she built this huge house that just is like a maze so i got a a cup from there that cup is so possessed yeah i'm sure i'm not gonna (laughs) drink out of it never coming over (laughs) did some shopping yesterday before i went to the 61 drive-in found some vinyls so i got twilight zone the movie classic soundtrack four box Miami Vice soundtrack. It's not horror, but I mean, it's 80s pop culture. That was two bucks. Weird, but classic. Rollerball. The front of that's just cool. That was five bucks. Obscure, but classic. Savage Streets. This is a promo for promotion only. You got Linda Blair's looking kind of cute on the front of that one with her leather. And this one's still sealed. Exploitation classic. The last one. <laughs> this promotion only. Shock Treatment. Didn't you get a copy of this, Jason? Shock treatment? We're talking about Rocky Horror. Yeah. I, I did. Somebody was nice enough to find two of them somewhere. I totally forgot about that. I sh- Couldn't find three of them, huh? Yeah. All right. Fine. No, there was only two. Yeah, I sent Jason a picture. I was like, look at these records I got. I spent 30 bucks. And he's like, shock treatment? I was like, yeah, I think there was another one. He's like, oh, well, go look. I've been looking to buy it for a lot more than $5. I was like, okay. So I went over there and yeah, they had one. Uh, I got to admit, I don't know what the shock treatment is. I mean, you just held it up. I saw it. I don't know what it is. Yeah, I've honestly never seen it. I know what it is. It's the sequel to Rocky Horror Picture Show. That is. That's the sequel. It's called Shock Treatment? Okay. All right. Yeah, written by Richard O'Brien, who was a riffraff. Yeah, I knew all about it, and I've seen it before, and just or the record before, and I wanted it just because, and then, yeah, he found one for me. That's one of those that's on my list to see whenever I have a spare moment. But I didn't know it was called Shock Dream, and I was just going to look up Rocky Horror Picture Show Part 2. I heard the movie was a, was a flop. It's I, I have to see it. Well, shoot, Rocky Horror Picture Show was probably a flop at the time, wasn't it? I mean... Right, but I think this one like continues to be a flop. Like I don't think it's I don't think it's picked up steam as a with a cult following or anything. There's no 10 a.m. showings on Sundays. <laughs> I always thought Rocky Horror was pretty big because it was a Broadway show or it was a show before and it was huge. And then they made this movie. I guess word is that Elvis wanted to play Meatloaf, Meatloaf's role in the movie. But they chose Meatloaf over Elvis for Eddie. I guess he was such a fan. So I'm, I'm trying to wrap my head around if I, I'm, I'm, I'm picturing Elvis in the role. I think it would work. 
I mean, I love Meatloaf so much in it that I don't want it to change, but eh, I wish there were some like audition tapes or something out there. Elvis doesn't have the same energy, though. Like, he couldn't belt out the whatever happened on Saturday. He'd be like, whatever happened on Saturday night. You know, it'd just be kind of more bluesy, but wow, wild. Be easier to catch him and kill him. Yeah, maybe we can get Eddie Murphy to do his Elvis impersonation as, you know, Eddie from... <laughs> yeah, he did on Delirious. I've lived a life of old. What about you, Clint? What'd you get? Let's see where I spent my money this time. Again, I made up for last time because last time I got not a damn thing. But you know, something I forgot to mention last time is the last episode when I didn't buy anything. I actually was buying some components to make my own toys, which uh, you guys have seen on my social media. I started uh, from uh, inkmirrors.com toy collectible line, just kind of a knockoff toy thing. So I made up a cool... uh, stooge from night of the demons where his tongue gets ripped out and uh it's got the backer card and his tongue and it's bloody and it's encased in the the blister there looks just like an action figure did the Susie did a lipstick tube you know where she shoves the the lipstick into her nipple so and uh, i've been working on some novelty sunglasses working on my night of the comet one that's what really started the whole thing and i I haven't been able to figure out how to seal the package correctly so besides that cheap plug bullshit i did spend some money this week uh, starts off with shells and clam shells. Yeah, I spent like right around a hundred dollars on a bunch of clear acrylic shelves. Uh, I ran out of room, uh, so I had to you know put more stuff up on on the walls. And then uh, I got this idea from Jason back at Flashback. Jason, you got that two piece clam shell to put your Linda in, which I thought was fantastic and protect that. So I got two, and I actually I have my Linda in that one, and I have the I have the action figure I got signed by Jim Crutt, the helicopter zombie. From Dawn of the Dead. So I encased that as well. I've talked about this before, but I ordered, uh, thanks to Jason, my Trick or Treat vinyl LP soundtrack that finally showed up. I got that up on the wall. Um, And I talked about these a while ago, but from LB3D Designs, my Evil Entities, Crypt Keeper, and Herschel Gordon Lewis action figures. I've talked about them, but they finally showed up. So I've got them displayed. And I've got my Crypt Keeper up on the wall now with my Tales from the Crypt metal cutout from Metal Devil Arts that uh, I met that guy and Days the Dead and Indian picked that up. So that's all kind of old new stuff. But the new stuff I got, the first, uh, first I was going to say edition or episode, but it's not the first issue. There we go. Of the new five issue series Creepshow comics came out a couple weeks ago, a week ago. And so I've got my ran down to my local comic shop and grabbed those. When these came out, all these different variant covers started coming out. And I'm like, oh, and I saw like, excuse me, a few of them when they look cool. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to get each each variant. But they just kept going and going and going. And I've joked about it before. I said, oh, there's 150. But I think there's literally like 23 different variant for the, the cover art for this this first edition comic or first issue. So I got the, the normal one. I got one variant that was available at the store. And then I had ordered another one from a specific artist. I, should, I wish I had it here with me, um, but it came with a... Um, Certificate of Authenticity. It's number one of 500. So that's pretty cool. I've got a few different um, editions of that. And then this is my big one. This is what I'm happy about. And Fright Rags recently released. And same thing. This was limited. I think they only did 1,000 or 2,000 or something like that. The Halloween 3 Mini Masks. And they each stand about six inches. They're in boxes, display boxes with cool artwork and see-through <laughs> windows. And they're fun. I got all three of them. They had the pumpkin. They had the witch. They had the skeleton. What I didn't know, and if you guys saw my unboxing video, I was shocked. When they ship this to you, they ship it in a cardboard box. They put print ink on the the box they ship it in that makes it look like it came from Silver Shamrock Novelties. Like it was a real thing that actually existed. And they were even smart enough to put the actual label to mail it to me on the bottom. So that way you can hide it. And then the way it's printed on the box is still visible. So I save the box. I don't care. I think it's cool, especially if if those things ever get sold, to be able to put them in that original box that's undamaged in that cool print. Uh, I wish I'd have known that I would have bought two. I was about to say, I'm surprised you didn't go back and order another just because of the outer box to keep it sealed. I thought about it, and I guess I should have looked. (laughs) I don't know why I didn't, but um, it was limited. And so I'm pretty sure they were sold out by the time I would have went back. And the, you know, I almost didn't order those because I was gun shy because the shipping was like astronomical. And I'm like, good God, this is a lot to ship these compared to what no, normal shipping is. And I went ahead and did it anyway. Well, then they sent me an email about a week later, Fright Rags did. And it said, oops, it said, sorry, we noticed we overcharged you. And they gave me like a $10 credit. 
I pass that along to Jason because I know Brian doesn't buy anything but movies. I had nothing else I want to buy from there. So <laughs> that's it. That is why I'm broke, mainly because of the shells and the clamshells. Everything else is stuff I've already spent money on for the most part. So Nice. Good pickups. You made up for last time. I think so. I'm kind of slowly getting back into it. I know I need to get some more of the clamshells. Um, I have a Sam from Trick or Treat reaction figure that I bought for cheap a long time ago. And now I kind of found out I saw somebody post it for sale and they wanted like 60, 70 bucks. So I guess it has some value that I didn't know about. So kind of want to throw it in a little clamshell. So I might have to order some more. There's actually some more stuff that I wanted to order that I, I held off on just uh, at, for a financial reason. You know, like I've got, but it seems like there's like a, my, my windshield just got a crack. So I got to replace that. There's 500 bucks out of my pocket. Homecoming was here. You know, Halloween's coming up. So we got to buy costumes and pumpkins and stuff. And I'm traveling here. Well, by the time this episode airs, I think I'll be there, but I'm getting ready to travel to Iowa for Halloween Palooza. That's like an eight hour drive for me. So I got some expense. So I held off on some stuff. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be able to hold off. Well, save room in your truck for stuff you bring home from Halloween Palooza. I'm hoping just to bring home a lot of good memories and, you know, some cash. Cash is always cool so I can buy the things I want. Yeah, speaking <laughs> of cash, uh, why don't we take it to a sponsor? It's time. It's time. Interrupt our program to bring you this important message. It's Friday, October 7th, and that means it's time for Halloween Palooza at the Bridgeview Center in Ottumwa, Iowa. You heard that right. Friday from 5 p.m. to 11 p.m. and Saturday, October 8th from noon to midnight, you can show up at 102 Church Street and be a part of the festivities that include a film festival, car display, hypnotist, zombie walk, costume contest, ghost hunt, stand-up comedy, the Rocky Horror Picture Show, and even a live podcast by the Spooky Boys of the I Like It Spooky Horror Podcast with special guest Justin Beam of Reverend Entertainment. But wait, there's more. In addition to the multiple vendors that will be on hand, Halloween Palooza at the Bridgeview Center in Ottumwa, Iowa features special celebrity guests Dwayne Whitaker, Naomi Grossman, and Debbie Rashawn. There's even more than that, but this commercial has to end at some point, so click over to Halloweenapalooza.com for more info, including ticket prices and event times. Then, show up and celebrate the 12th year of this ever-growing event with all of us. See you at the Bridgeview Center at 102 Church Street in Ottumwa, Iowa for Halloween Palooza. Clint, aren't you going to do the laugh? I mean, I did the laugh the last two commercials. Come on now. Oh, uh, come on. Do the laugh. <sighs> All right. <clears throat> <laughs> so now that we've heard from our sponsor this episode we are covering the 2022 horror comedy the monsters it's a horror comedy classic I think this is honestly, and I, 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 I mean it when I say this, this is probably going to be one of the most controversial episodes that we've ever recorded. And, and we don't talk about this ahead of time. So I have no idea how Brian feels. I have no idea how Clint feels. I'm excited for this. I've got a page full of notes here to tell you how I feel. I have no notes. So I, uh, I sat down this week with uh, Finley, who's my four-year-old, and Tiffany, my girlfriend, and we watched The Munsters. And I uh, just put it on because it was out and it's kid appropriate. I mean, there's a couple scenes in it that, you know, they they say some curse words, but they're bleeped out. You know what they're saying, but they're bleeped out. But there's no gore. No one dies. It, it was just a fun. I enjoyed it. I'm going to be the first to say that I enjoyed the movie. I said to a friend, our friend Brian Clark, who's a friend of the show, um, I said, I enjoyed it. And Finley laughed and he said, that's what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be so that you can watch it and enjoy it and four-year-olds or six-year-olds can laugh. That's what it's supposed to be. I actually, I, I even laughed a couple times out loud. That doesn't happen a whole lot. Yeah, I did too. Yeah. Well, when I started the movie, uh, I don't know where my mindset was 
And I think that was a problem going into the movie. I started watching it and I was annoyed by the terrible acting that is in Rob Zombie's movies. I like Richard Brake, like his characters and stuff. He's the one who played the the professor who put Herman together. Dr. Wolfgang. And his acting was just terrible. And then I was I was like, so I was criticizing that. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, stop. I'm like, it's a comedy. It's supposed to be fun. It's in the vein of the monsters, the 1960s absolute classic TV show. So I need to kind of go back to that. And I mean, even in that, you know, the acting wasn't the greatest. I mean, I thought it was good, but so I had to kind of reset my mind like 20 minutes into it. From then on, I had a good time. Well, and that's something I said to Tiffany. I said, people are bashing this because the acting's bad and the music's bad or they hate this and they hate that. And I said, it's not like the Munsters was some cinematic achievement of television. It was on for two years. It was not like this beloved TV show like Bonanza that lasted for 20 years or MASH that was on forever and won all these awards. It was on for two years and it did not do well. So it was canceled. You know, I got a couple movies after and it's got a cult following, but it's not like it was this beloved thing at the time. You know, we kind of have those, you know, what do they call them? The 80s sheen or whatever it is when you look back at movies that you're nostalgic back. I feel like we have that for the Munsters. And we go back and watch it now, and it's just supposed to be fun. I think the monster, the original monsters, I think it would have lasted longer if it wasn't for Batman. So curse you, Adam West. Although because of that, we got to see <laughs> Vincent Price's Egghead, which was pretty damn cool. But so I kind of, I'm just gonna follow along as this goes because I wrote down some different people's performances in this. Uh, but you brought up Richard Brake, and I thought his performance as Dr. Wolfgang was, was great because I was looking at it in the lens that you stopped yourself to, to take yourself to, Jason, was if he just would have went out there and talked like you or I talked, you know what I mean? This is supposed to be, well, in tra- it was in Transylvania, so everything's supposed to be very over the top and dark crazy, you know, so it had to be like that. I did think, though, my opinion, that it started out his performance was great, and but it got As it went on, it was like the ripple got bigger and he started to get a little over the top as it went on, like when he came back from the leper colony and stuff. And it didn't even really serve a purpose in the story anymore. He was just kind of there. So I thought his performance got a little over the top there. But I also found out that he played Orlock also. A lot of the people in this played dual characters. And the Orlock character was fantastic. That dude was hilarious. Yeah, even when he was doing techno dancing at the club. He was great. Oh, I didn't realize that was him. I'm sorry, Richard Brake. (laughs) <laughs> like, he's an intense looking dude, man. You ever see him? Next time we see him at a convention, I'm going to go over and be like, hey, man, my buddy over there says that you sucked in the monsters. And he's going to come over and have a, have a fucking talk with you. <laughs> so the premise of the movie is this is the, a prequel to the TV show. It's when Herman meets Lily. They fall in love. Yeah, she's going on dates. Their grandpa's sending her on, or her dad, but, you know, is sending her on. And she just can't meet the right man. She doesn't have feelings for any of them. And then Herman is created by the doctor and she sees him on TV and she just falls in love. Love at first sight. So it's their relationship and them falling in love and all that stuff. And that was another thing I saw people bashing the movie about. They're like, well, their kids aren't around. And it's like their kids aren't born. This is before the TV show. And I it got to the point where I was just reading and I'm just like, people are just being difficult to be difficult and hating on it just to hate on it. Just because they want to, because I have nothing better to do. So I, I want to read you this blurb, and this is uh, that I found this on Facebook. It's a guy that we follow each other. Um, he, he posted this publicly, so I'm sure he won't mind. His his name is Gary Von Davis. This is kind of long, but I'll, I'll do my best to get through it quick. And I think this kind of sums up what is going on with the love hate relationship with this Rob Zombie Monsters movie. This comment is from a member of the Rob Zombie group that I'm a member of. Gary says, "Quote: The thing is, it's the monsters." It's a pitch-perfect update of the classic show. I've been watching that show since I was a kid and binged all of it. The original series, the movies, the monsters today, the Mockingbird, Mockingbird lame pilot, etc. In anticipation of Rob's movie. And all I kept thinking as I watched the new film is, man, he got this exactly right. This is the monsters, just as it should be. I think there are four main groups of haters. People who've never actually seen or been a fan of the original show. 
people who will never accept any version of the show without the original cast, which I thought I was going to have a problem with. I just put that in there. People who expect Rob to do some dark and gory and foul mouth take on the material and people just automatically who automatically hate anything that's made by Rob Zombie. And 99% of the negative reviews come from people who fit in one or more of those categories. I know that was kind of long, but I thought it was important to say, because again, when I, when I came across Gary's post there and I read that, I was like, man, it does it. It perfectly encapsulates, encapsulates ugh, what is going on here. Yeah, and that kind of goes into us also, because I think we've talked about it before when the trailer came out, and I was like, oh, I don't know about Jeff Daniel Phillips as Herman. Not everybody can be Fred Gwynn, which I thought he was fantastic, but eh, Jeff Daniel Phillips did pretty well. I liked his laugh. What do you guys feel about that? That was a big part of it. I thought it was pretty good. Fantastic. I thought I was going to hate him, too. I told you that. Uh, I had I have all faith in Daniel Roebuck to pull off Grandpa, the count. And he did exactly what I thought he was going to do. Daniel Roebuck was amazing. Jeff Daniel Phillips surprised me. He took that Herman Munster character, unlike anybody since Fred Gwynn, and made it his own. I still had issue with how I thought at times he sounded like Sheldon from The Big Bang Theory. When he talked like this, you know, and it was just kind of... Uh, yeah, he took that part and made it his own. He blew me away. He also, where is it in my notes? Jeff Daniel Phillips, he also played Zombo, which was just in there for a minute. I didn't know that. And then, of course, he played Shecky Von Rothbone because he got Shecky Von Rothbone's brain. I like Rob Zombie movies, or I like Rob Zombie. I don't like all of his movies, but I do have an appreciation at times for him. They're not all fantastic in my mind, so going along with that. You know, this is good. I thought this was a good one. Sherry Moon Zombie. I thought she was fantastic as Lily. Like, no complaints about her at all. Like, I think she kind of, even from the trailer, I thought she was kind of, she kind of nailed it there too. And so, I mean, I, I see what you're saying, how a lot of people are in one of those groups. I feel like I'm in a couple of them, but I actually liked the movie for different reasons, I guess. Sherry played Lily, obviously, and she also played Donna Doomler. So again, she she pulled double duty in this. And all these people that I'm mentioning that play these multiple roles, I think what makes them decent actors is I had no freaking idea that they were also that, like Jason just said, you're like, oh, Jeff Daniel Phillips was Orlock also? Like I had no clue. So they were able to completely create different characters. I am going to say some negative stuff about this. Sherry is one of the negative things. And I'm not a, oh, Rob Zombie put Sherry in all his movies thing. You know, it's kind of the running joke. And sometimes it is, does get a little old, but I don't, I don't hate Sherry. I don't hate Rob for putting Sherry in a, in a lot of roles. I didn't enjoy her as Lily. And mainly from my issue with, with her was her voice. Her voice almost had like cerebral palsy and it was so shaky and it just was very over the top. And I wish she would have toned it down the original Lily was more kind of that soothing kind of velvet voice. And I, so I don't know why she decided to take it, make it sound like a 2.6 on a Richter scale, you know, or just jumping all around. I mean, she, she made it her own. So I'll give her credit there, but I, I did not jo enjoy her, her portrayal of, of Lily. Yeah. There were a couple of times that I kind of thought her voice was odd, but I, I, again, I didn't mind her as Lily. I thought she did a, a good job. I mean, it's hard to do these iconic characters. They're iconic now, but, you know, go back and do them and make them your own and make everybody happy. It's It'll never happen. I mean, I'm sorry. I think that's one of the reasons that I feel this was a successful project was because the renditions of the monsters in the past, when they try to reboot it and stuff, I think everybody was trying so hard to be the original character. And I think this go around, I think they paid homage to the original characters, but again, made it their own. And I think that's why it's successful. I wanted to talk about what I really loved about the movie was um, set and costume design. I know there was a lot of talk about if it was going to be black and white, if it was going to be color. It was in color and the colors were vivid. <laughs> I loved all the neon. I loved the set design. I mean, Herman Co Herman's like outfits were kind of kind of weird. It, it was fun. You know, it's I loved that. And, uh, you know, it's just... I, I think they threw a lot of money at it. Do you got the? Do you have the budget there, Clint? It's funny because uh, before this came out, there were rumors that it cost forty million. And Rob Zombie actually got online. And he was like, "Where the fuck did someone get this figure? I wish I had forty million. So sources say that the figure is closer to nine million, which sounds like a lot of money. But in, in all reality, for for a production anymore, nine millions uh, the same as seven hundred thousand to make Night of the Comet. It's not a lot of money. Now they f did they they filmed it in Hungary, right? Uh, I believe so. 
I'm thinking I heard that, so I don't know if that had something to do with keeping the budget down. The town that they made, or Mockingbird Lane. Oh, it was, it was spot on, spot on. And I saw Rob; he would post movie or post clips on Facebook and other social places where he would take pictures of it, and it looked great. Then they had the whole Halloween theme when, of course, they show up. So that was that was fun showing how they arrived in town. Everybody thought it was a costume that they had on, and. So you, you talked about the lighting. I actually had a love-hate relationship with the lighting. Coming from a haunted house background, I loved it because that is um, that is a cool way that a haunted house would be. I always kept my haunt a little bit darker, but I had specific areas where I went real bold. And it's kind of an artistic choice. You got some people in the industry who love to go with those bold, bright contrasts. And it, it was beautiful. It was beautiful. But I felt that it, if he would have toned it down just a little bit, it would have taken maybe just a little bit of the cartoony out of this. Because, again, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here. It is the Munsters. It's supposed to be cheesy, tongue-in-cheek, corny. But I, I, I don't know. I kind of wish he would have toned. Because sometimes the lighting almost washed out. Like there was, you know, Grandpa's or the Cowan or whatever you want to call him. Just sitting there reading his newspaper. And he's just washed out with this green light. I just wish he would have toned it down a little bit in certain scenes. Because the beginning, when they're in Transylvania, it was almost like I was watching Halloween Town. Everything was very big and over the top and colorful. And But I'm not arguing arguing with you, Jason. The set design, it, it was cool. Oh, you can argue with me. You know, we can we can have opinions. You can be wrong. I can be right. It's all right. It was actually filmed in Budapest. Yeah, see, I, I didn't want to say hungry because I wasn't for sure. I knew it was something like that. Yeah, I enjoyed the lighting and the bright light, all the vivid colors and the set design. There was a couple creatures like the creature from the Black Lagoon. I was like, oh, that's kind of a cheap looking costume. But I mean... It was nice to see the creature and it was nice to see the wolf man and, you know, all the classic universal monsters were in it. It was fun to see that. Nosferatu, you know, at the beginning was probably my favorite character in the whole movie. I wish we had got a sprinkle of him throughout the movie. You know, he'd come back and, you know, try to win Lily back or something fun like that, you know, or shows up at their wedding. Don't you remember the newspaper article? He got uh, consumed by his own rats. All of his pet rats that he <laughs> liked so much ate him. Uh, I want to give you just real quick. I'll let you guys finish there, but I want to give you guys a little geography lesson that uh, Budapest is the capital of Hungary. So, <laughs> so it's like right when you said Bud- right when you said Budapest, I'm like it's fucking in Hungary. <laughs> like Jason, Jason wears a couple hats. He is our financial department, and now he is also part of our international affairs. He handles all of our international policy and stalking. Yeah, he was probably stalking Rob Zombie when he's like, "Oh yeah, I knew where he was at." <laughs> oh, I wish that'd be awesome. Why is that guy following us around everywhere? Jason, you were talking about the, the color as opposed to the black and white. And yeah, when, when these trailers came out, we were all talking. I actually enjoyed the trailers more in the black and white than I did the color. But anyway, so I read um, that according to Variety magazine, Rob Zombie said he wasn't allowed to shoot in black and white. So that's why he did the lighting like he did. He's like, all right, fine. I'm going to take it and do a really hyper surreal He's, he said, I'm going to do it as hyper, as surreal as possible. So he just punched it up. But he was able to sneak in the black and white at the very end. You know, like the, the movie ends. And then it was kind of weird, but the movie ends. And then it goes into them recreating the opening of the original show, which was black and white. Uh, I thought that was kind of neat. A little, little jarring, but it was cool. I guess one of the other issues that I had with it, but I have a justification for this also, is I, I was watching it and I kind of thought the story like meandered. Like it wasn't pointless. It moved along. I don't think it had a pacing issue, but there was something, something missing. I'm like, oh, the story is just kind of meandering through and okay, now this is happening. Oh, that is happening. And then it kind of hit me. I was like, well, maybe it seems like that because this is the feature length film where the, the tone of the story in this was exactly like the tone of the story in the original show, which there you only had a half hour show with commercials. So we're talking what, 18 minutes of, of episode or whatever, you know, per episode. So I think maybe to me it seemed like the story just kind of meander because it was it was ongoing. But this was definitely yeah. You could almost cut the sh- movie up into parts though and watch like the first part where she's dating before she meets Herman, and then the second part where they're falling in love, and then the part where they get married, and and then the ending where they move to America. So you could probably cut it up into four, you know, three or four parts, and it would be more of a TV show than a movie. They moved to California and I checked with Jason and Jason told me that California is in America. <laughs> Correct. Correct. <laughs> yeah. Going with the comedy though, there, there were some times, you know, where I had a good little chuckle, especially like close to the end when Herman goes out and 
everybody's not in their costumes anymore and they're just regular people. And that was just absolutely horrific to them. And then uh, Herman with his Shirley Temples on the airplane. That's, <laughs> that's <still> good. <laughs> I'm never drinking Shirley Temples again. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I like uh, I like real subtle dry humor that always makes me laugh. So there was little tiny things like back in Transylvania when um he was backstage with his band and the band were like the kind of skeleton like fifties greaser slick back hair guys and there was just a little comment where he was he asked a question and he's like what do you guys think and they were just kind of like oh we don't know shit you know we don't know anything I don't know what it was it just made me laugh and, uh, <laughs> and then around the same time there was a scene where Herman was going to pose in a picture with somebody and so he's getting ready to pose and he does the whole like what we always run into at conventions where we you know you point at each other and they they made the comment I think it was the uh, the hunchback was like dude don't do the finger pointing thing you know and it, it was funny. <laughs> <laughs> and there was something at the end of the movie that I'm going to have to go back and watch that I remember I laughed out loud at for a minute. And I don't remember what it was, but in my notes, I had written down the words, darn, darn, darn. And so I remember Herman saying that. So apparently whatever he said, darn, darn, darn about, I thought was fucking funny. I don't remember that part. I mean, I remember him saying that, but yeah, I don't remember what. And we also got the origin story for Spot, kind of. I mean, they find Spot, their pet. That was fun. And you see Spot. You see him in the bathtub. That was something I thought was weird, as Jason, you just talked about um, Herman's reaction to humans in California the day after Halloween, and he was all freaked out. But I thought, isn't that weird, though? Because when they were in Paris on their honeymoon, they were amongst humans. And they were commenting, like, oh, that's weird that they're running the other way. Uh, which is, you know, typical monsters. Part of the, the charm of the original monsters was them trying to figure out why the hell is everybody freaking out, you know, which was actually like social commentary on everybody accepting everybody. And you know, I thought it was weird, though, in the movie, how in Paris they didn't think twice of it. But in America, other than for they thought everybody was monsters. So I can see that being his shock to wake up the next day and go, oh, my God, they're not. They're these hideous humans. I hope we get a second one. To kind of go more into it, see how Marilyn comes into it. And what do you guys think? Do you think we'll get a sequel? I hope so. I think it. I hope so. I think we will. If Rob Zombie's proven anything, if he's if he wants to do it, he's going to do it, whether people love it or hate it. So whether you do love or hate Rob, I have a love hate relationship with Rob. There's stuff I think that he never should have done, and there's stuff I think he's is the best ever. But bottom line, if he wants to do it, he's going to do it. He, he kind of does his own thing, which I is commendable. I think. It always comes down to the money. We're, we're going to see how it performs. I think it's going to be hard, though, because anymore we're so thirsty for anything as, as a horror community. Monsters will be number one because everybody's watching it. Whether they're going to love it or hate it, it doesn't matter. It's going to be on the top of the charts, which so on paper, it's going to look, hey, this is successful. Let's redo it. I think one of the big things that he has going for him that would maybe get him a sequel is all the actors seem to really embrace the fans. I've seen, you know, Jeff Daniel Phillips and Daniel Roebuck on social media thanking the fans every day, several times a day. I mean, Butch Patrick thanking people and sharing his love for the movie. And I think that's, you know, we talked about with a spider one and our friend Sarah um, that did the allegoria that brings people in. That makes people feel like they're part of something. We are. We're part of a horror community and family. That would be a reason that people are going to say, hey, go watch this movie. Go check it out. People will watch it. People will buy it. I almost picked it up the other day at Target. They had it on Blu-ray, and I was like, it's got a nice slip. I like the cover. I'll probably end up buying a copy of it. I think that comes with a poster also. I. It's something that I can sit down with any kid, you know, Finley or Jack, or when my granddaughter's older, you can watch this. You don't have to worry about blood or guts or nudity, and you can introduce them into the horror genre. This is something you can put on with anybody. Put it on if you're having a party and not have to worry about kids seeing something that their parents don't want them to see. The allure of the, the monsters, I think, has always been there. It'll continue to be there. So I think maybe we, we will see more. I've always looked at the Munsters and the Adams family as kind of like Cheers and Night Court. Cheers and the Adams family were always a little more sophisticated, a little more highbrow humor, maybe a little more artistic. And Night Court and the Munsters were always kind of the lowbrow, brow beater humor. 
been in the gutter and, and ate with Kings and Queens, but I'm most comfortable at that corner hole in the wall bar. And so I've always loved the Munsters. I've always loved Night Court. There, there, there's an audience for it. There's a love for it. You guys are smiling as I'm saying this because I'm touching a little nerve by saying that. You know, you're like, you're like, God damn, you're right. Exactly. So it's yeah, you are. Yeah. Um, and I mean, this was a complete love letter from Rob Zombie to the Monsters. And so, even if you hate this film, you need to. That shows if you don't recognize that whether you love it or hate it, that this was a person who completely understood and appreciated the original project and is showing the world how it influenced him then maybe you're not, you know, fans of film. I don't know. I don't want to knock anybody, but it's just, it's so authentic and apparent. Now I want to watch Night Court. (laughs) They're rebooting, they're rebooting (laughs) Night Court. Did you know that? Oh, I can't wait for that. I don't know if it's going to be the same, but it's a Harry's daughter as a judge. Yeah, Harry's daughter is going to be the judge. And then the only other original character is going to be John Larroquette, you know, Dan. But that's how I'm wondering how in, in today's world with cancel culture and prevalent PC, I don't see Dan Fielding being able to make the same jokes and humor that he could in the 80s. But he I, he's supposed to. I mean, he's older. And at the end of the, the series, he kind of grew up and went after Christine, the love of his life. So I'm curious if he's going to maybe he's aged well. Oh, I got more fun facts. Come on, guys. You got to let me get my page of notes in. We're, we're adding a new segment to the show. At the end of every show, it's going to be Clint's Fun Facts Corner. And it's kind of little <laughs> bullet points that I've written down, written down that I haven't been able to fit into our conversation. So we'll start at the top and head on down. All right. One of the first things I noticed, and this was a goof, I think. I'm not mad at it. It's just something I noticed. the very In the very beginning, when they the pianist zombie, they were there to dig him up. He wasn't in his coffin. He had a suitcase like he was coming back from a trip, getting ready to go back to sleep in his coffin, kill him and steal his brain. When he was lying on the ground, he, you know, he's a zombie. He was all, you know, tore up suit. His pants were all tore up. But if you watch it again, when he's lying on the ground, underneath his torn up pants, there was like this weird blue, like he had blue spandex on underneath or something. I think it was a goof. I watched it and I kind of rewound and watched it again, thinking it was a shadow. And I'm like, no, he's got like some blue. I don't know what the hell it was like a compression sock pants on underneath that or something. It was strange. Like he just got back from maybe, maybe his uh, vacation was, he was deep sea diving and he was the zombie and in Fulci's uh, zombie. Was that Fulci where he's fighting the the real shark? Yeah. Maybe that's what it was. You wanted like the zombie from a, Night of the Living Dead 1990, where he's got no pants on. But yeah, exactly. <laughs> We're going to be authentic, you know. No, uh, regardless, though, it, just, I, it was really weird because it was like this bright, solid blue. And I'm like, why does he have that on underneath? I don't know. He's got long underwear on. It's weird. And there's spandex. Bullet point no. It's cold in Transylvania. I guess so. Bullet point number two. Um, Daniel, I talked about characters who played multiple characters, actors who played multiple characters. Uh, Daniel Roebuck, who played Grandpa or the Count. He also played uh, Ezra Mosher. So again, playing different characters, and I had no idea while I was watching it. And, and something, I don't know if you guys thought this, another reason that I really, again, I had full faith in Daniel Roebuck. I was on the fence about Herman, about Jeff Daniel Phillips. They had a great chemistry, and it grew throughout the film. I thought they played well together. And they should, because in the original, Grandpa and Herman had a great chemistry together, and I think they did a good job of recreating that. Did you guys catch Butch Patrick? The original Eddie from the original Monsters. Did you catch him in this film? I knew he was in it, but I didn't catch who he was. Yeah, don't worry. I didn't either until I looked it up. And he was the voice of the Tin Can Man who married Herman and Lily. Yeah, you would never, because it was this guy's like a robot. Yeah, you you would never know that. But it's still cool that he had a had a credited part in the film. That was funny. Can someone please call 911? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Towards the end, when Herman flipped out after he realized that monsters in California were humans, he did the car 54 line. He came back in, he's all closes the door and he leans his back up against the door and he goes, oh my God, what are we going to do? Car 54, where are you? Which I thought was classic because oh. Fred Gwynn played in car 54, where are you? And I, in the original show, I think he even had a line where he, Fred Gwynn ref, as Herman Munster referenced car 54. So I thought that was cool. I didn't even pick up. Yeah, I heard it, but yeah. And this is stupid. I know this is some dumb little trivial thing, but when they first got 
to <clears throat> California and they're, they're going around town with Elvira. Elvira was the real estate agent and everybody's dressed up for Halloween. They walked past a prop. It was the Crypt Keeper laugh. You know, like you walk past an animated prop and it has a laugh or its eyes light up. But this was the actual Crypt Keeper laugh, which I thought was cool. It was a little nod to that. Like it was almost like he hired, uh, what's the guy's name? John, I can't remember his name right now. Yeah, thank you. It was was almost like he said, called him up and said, John, record your laugh real quick. And he put it in the movie. So that's my list. Done. Like a dealer at a casino, hands up, I'm done. So what do we got for ratings? Who wants to go first? Jason usually goes first. What do you think? You want to go first, Jason? Yeah, heck yeah, I'll go first. I think we we all kind of enjoyed it, so it's pretty unanimous with you know all the hate that's going on. That I'm glad we all kind of came through and saw the good stuff in it. I want to give it a seven out of ten, which I think is pretty damn strong. It, it was it was a good movie. I enjoyed it. I'll watch it again, and I hope we have a sequel. Seven stewardesses jumping out of airplanes for no fucking reason <laughs> out of 10 right out she of was 10. like well i better serve him his drink first i'll take care of my duties and now i'm getting the hell out of here what do you think clint so i got two different ratings for this just as a recreation of the original if that was the category for this how do how do i feel this was as compared to the original then i'm gonna go nine out of ten orlocks rats um, I, I thought Rob Zombie did a really good job, a, a damn near perfect job of creating the original. Reason it's not 10 out of 10 is because I think it was a little bit more over the top than the original, but that's also Rob Zombie's style. You know what I mean? He kind of punches up his influences from when he was younger and tosses them in your face more. So it's not like it was a shock. As far as an overall taking that out of, out of the equation and just was this a fun movie to watch, then I mean... Um, it's only one step down, but I'm going to go eight out of 10 Orlocks rats. It was entertaining. Again, it's, it's been referred to as the gateway drug to horror. This is, we said it, all of us in this, this recording so far, you can show your young child this along with Hocus Pocus and Hocus Pocus two, And, you know, kind of get them started in this genre without freaking them out. It was fun. It was fucking groovy, baby. I think I'm going to go uh, seven out of 10. Also, we watched it. Finn and I watched it. She fell asleep because we got it started late, but Tiffany enjoyed it. It's something that it will become, you know, a staple of probably our home as she ages every year. At Halloween, you know, we do Hocus Pocus and we'll add Hocus Pocus too. And we'll add the Munsters and the Great Pumpkin Charlie Brown, you know, and the Garfield special. And this is going to become one of those that I buy. And every year we will put on at Halloween until she ages out of it, if she does. And then we move on to Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2 and Halloween 2 and Friday 13th Part 5 and stuff like that, you know. But uh, this is definitely going to become one of those that we watch for the next couple of years, every year. The beauty of that stuff, though, and maybe it's just me. I've talked before about how I feel you always come back to your 10-year-old self. Now that my kids like Boots, you know what I mean? Boots is my youngest, and she went with me to see Smile last night. I wouldn't have done that two years ago with her. So she, now my youngest, so obviously my oldest, we've moved on to these Friday the 13th Part 2s and Silent Night, Deadly Nights, and we're not quite at I Spit on Your Grave yet or anything, but but I, <laughs> I, still, I still myself... I watched The Monsters by myself. Melissa was there with me, but she was tired and fell asleep. She's been getting over a cold. But I mean, I, I would love to watch. I'll watch it again by myself. And so like, we're going to put up our Halloween decorations this year. Everything you just mentioned, even though we've graduated the kids, these more adult horror flicks, we're going to be watching Garfield Halloween, Charlie Brown Halloween, and we're all going to love it. It just happens. It has to. So I think I will give it a seven out of 10 Shirley Temples. So now that we've rated the movie, do we have a question, Clint? We do, but I got. I want to. I want to add one more thing, and that is, I meant what I said. Where I feel this is a very controversial episode because, like that Gary Von Davis guy, whose quote I read earlier, he also talked about he has friends who have now blocked him and like deleted him, unfriended him on Facebook because of his opinion of the monsters. And I know that we are in a very kind of <laughs> tense world right now with everything going on, but everybody. It, hopefully we don't lose listeners to this show because we all seem to like the film. It's different strokes for different folks, man. And, and I just hope that everybody can uh, learn to appreciate and get along and realize that Halloween kills isn't the best movie, but it's okay because we're all still going to go see Halloween ends. 
Well, you guys are lucky that you guys liked this movie because I had my finger on the unfriend button. I was like, fuck these guys. That's crazy to me, right? Like, he wasn't joking. How tense and wound up do you have to be to unfriend somebody on social media because they liked the Munsters movie and you didn't? I'm going to be freaking out and I'm going to be getting a hold of Brian like, you know, three or four days after this episode drops. What are the numbers? What are the numbers? Be like negative 200. <laughs> Uh, questions we did get a question we got a question this week from our buddy ted from ted's marvelous custom gumball emporium and ted's pretty direct and to the point he just said best place to hide a body question mark asking for a friend (laughs) so one thing that comes to mind i remember seeing this on a movie show or something and it's always stuck with me body into a wood chipper into like a hog trough thing because i guess the hogs will just eat everything after you've chopped it up or whatever and i don't remember what i saw that on but that's always kind of stuck with me and i'm like ah, oh, it's a good way to get rid of it i mean there's going to be dna evidence but you know at least the body's going to be gone i think the hogs will eat everything but the teeth but i don't know if they'll they can't eat the teeth they don't they can't chew it or something okay so then i, I want to change that then knock out their teeth <laughs> <laughs> and then everything yeah, i just everything said, said. <laughs> You're explaining what you want to do to people who go against your opinion of the monsters. No comment. I'm not going to incriminate myself if something happens to you guys. (laughs) One of my chuckles during the movie was when they're building Herman and they're getting ready to bring him to life. They're going to the castle or whatever it is, the mad scientist or doctor's castle. And one of the signs on the gate says, no trespassing. We're sick of hiding the bodies <laughs> or something. Along the <laughs> I, just busted out laughing. I was like, oh, that's a great sign. I need that for my house. Like I say, if you're going to hide a body, you hide it in Budapest. Far from me. <laughs> I, I have no idea where you would hide a body. I mean, in your ex-wife's backyard. I don't know. Like, what me? <laughs> if you don't have an ex-wife, sorry, Jason, you're out of luck. <laughs> your ex-wife's front porch. What do you... <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Ted asked this question. I'm sitting in the garage with Melissa, and I look at her, and I said, Ted just threw a question to the show, and she said, what is it? I said the question, and she just kind of gets this smile. And then I'm like, oh, God. Because she watches all those true crime shows like religiously. So again, Melissa knows like 72 ways to dispose of me that I haven't even thought of yet. You know, when I had the haunted house, it was so far set back that I always joked like, I'll dispose bodies back here. No one will ever know. And now that the people who own it, who took it away from me have it, it's kind of like you just said about your ex-wife. Now I'll do that even more. I don't get blamed. They do. But uh, I'm sitting there watching Melissa smile and her gears click. And I looked at her. I'm like, you're going to make me into a dude smoothie, aren't you? You're going to throw me in a barrel with a bunch of acid or something. And she said, no, that the best way to dispose of a body was, and I'm trying to remember now. I should have wrote this down, but it was a true case that she watched. Gosh, I can't remember now. Hey, edit this because I'm going to go ask her real quick. Hold on. It's really good. (laughs) So apparently the kids... Must have hid Melissa's body because I can't find her. I should have wrote that down. Sorry about that. But there was there was a, a true <laughs> there was a true crime case that she was telling me about, and she explained it. And she was like, "This is how this guy disposed of his kids and his his wife and stuff." Oh no, I remember now. I remember he he killed his wife, <laughs> and he took her to the desert. And apparently, there's these like caverns in the desert that go down forever and they're like just big enough to slip a body down in and they're all over the place. I don't know what specific state, but you know, Utah, Nevada, Arizona, you know, the Southwest. And so they think that's where this guy disposed of his wife after he killed her. And I think because he even joked to a coworker after he did it, like, Oh, I'd probably toss my wife down this cavern because they'll never find her. And it's something that it's so narrow and crazy that they can't send anybody down. They can't even like send a camera down, I guess to find so yeah caverns in the desert that is the best place ted to hide a body and uh, it sounds like we know a few people who know how to get the body there or do some other things along the way i ted lives by me i don't know why he's asking maybe he's going to be showing up at my house and a favor to ask here pretty soon can i borrow your shovel clint you got a wood chipper (laughs) some pigs (laughs) well now that we've talked about our question you know what we're not hiding Our amazing podcast network, the PFPN. So let's get a word from them. Your 
You're listening to the Prescribed Films Podcast Network, home to hundreds of hours of free podcast entertainment. The shows on this network all have a common goal, providing you with the best discussions about movies and other forms of entertainment media. The PFPN hopes to fill your ear holes with audio joy. Visit our website with links to all the other amazing shows at www.thepfpn.com. Thanks for listening. So now that we've heard from our podcast network, let's hear what we're up to. What do you got, Jason? Anything going on? Yeah, yeah, some big stuff. Spooky season, like I mentioned before. We're all going to be at Halloween of Palooza. Uh, so, so by the time you hear this within the next couple days, that's where we're going to be. Uh, Tumwa, Iowa. Come out, check it out, check us out. We'll all be there. It's going to be a great time. Got some good celebrities, good vendors all set up. Middle of the whole country. Iowa, come on out. It'll be a good time. I'm excited for that. A lot closer to those caverns in the southwest to hide bodies than where I'm at. So, <laughs> Because of our schedule of being there, this episode I think is going to drop day of. Halloween of Palooza is Friday and Saturday, and that's October 7th and 8th, right? I don't have a calendar in front of me. Yeah. So I think I think this episode is going to drop on the 7th. So um, you're going to be getting some double doses because um, on the 8th, which will be a day after this episode airs, us, the I Like a Spooky Horror Podcast, will be doing a live at Halloween Palooza. We're going to be in a live stage in front of an audience, and we're going to be hanging out with Justin Beam of Reverend Entertainment, and we're going to be discussing some Grindhouse trailers. Uh, I'm looking forward to this. Uh, it's going to be, I think, our first time of doing a uh, a live podcast together. We've done some video snippets and stuff like that before, kind of on the fly that have been fun. And we always seem to pull it off. I think it's, you know, my charm and your guys' good looks, but who knows? I could be wrong. That's going to be exciting. <laughs> and, you know, Jason just mentioned Halloween of Palooza and the guests. Dwayne Whitaker is going to be there. Debbie Rashawn's going to be there. And um, I feel like an idiot right now because I just, for, oh, Naomi Grossman. Naomi Grossman is going to be there vendors and events and there's going to be what trivia with insane mike and there's going to be ghost tours and i just go to halloweenapalooza.com find them on facebook check out why when you're listening to this episode you should hop right in the car and drive over and check it all out anything you want to say about it brian halloween apalooza it, it's a thing it's coming up i might go Brian and I also have an event coming up the weekend after that. I'm going to let him talk about that because, you know, it's his thing. But I'm excited. There's a couple of Rocky Horror Picture Show screenings going on this next few weeks. Halloween and Palooza has one. Uh, the Orpheum Theater in uh, Galesburg, Illinois has one going on. And uh, the Capitol Theater in Burlington, Iowa has one going on. We're sponsoring that one, too, I think. Aren't we? Yeah, yeah. Yep. Kind of got my our pick of that, so... Might just go for all three of them. Who the hell knows? And then just other spooky season. Got some decorations up. Going to get some more up and just going to enjoy enjoy it. All right, Brian. What do we have coming up next week after this? So we do have Halloween Palooza coming up. Like Clint said, you will be hearing this episode. It sounds like we're going to drop it early so that we can go to Halloween Palooza and have a good time. Hang out and have fun. And then we have football. That's, of course, going on. I'm not sure anybody cares about that. but And then, yes, we have uh, Joe Bob Briggs at the Capitol Theater in Burlington, Iowa, for How Rednecks Saved Hollywood. That's the 15th. There are tickets still available. Go to the Capitol Theater website, and you can get tickets for that. Um, 40 bucks. You get a meet and greet, an autograph, I believe, um, and to meet Joe Bob. That's all fun. And then we have the Orpheum Theater. So much stuff in October. I'm actually going to set up a table again on the 14th for the thing at the Orpheum. They've been gracious enough to let me set up another table, hand out some stickers, some buttons, probably give a t-shirt away, just watch the movie and have a fun time. So that'd be the 14th at 8 p.m. That's a free show, and you can't pass up the thing on the big screen. I mean, you can't pass up the thing on a little screen. How would you pass it up on a big screen? And it's free. They have great concessions. They have beer, wine. Um, alcohol, popcorn, candy, all kinds of cool stuff. You might win a t-shirt. You never know. That's all I can think of before our next episode. I have a wedding. Our friends uh, that are on uh, the Brett and Tony podcast with Ash and Aid, Brett is getting married. I guess he's maybe already married, but they're having a wedding reception in Burlington. So I'll be in Burlington for that too. I think that's all I got. What about you, Clint? You got anything? You know, kind of sort um, Yeah, hold on. So I got a bunch of shit going on. Um <clears throat> 
But I got to hold on. I got to stop because Jason's over here. He's trying to heckle me. He just sent me this. He just sent me this Facebook message and it's a knockoff toy. And it's got Roy from Ghostbusters on the side. His picture's on there and his eyes are all oh, rolled back. And the toy is called Ghost BJ. And inside of the blister, there's nothing. And hold on. What does it say here? It says, <laughs> it says, Bustin makes me feel good. Oh, look. Below that, there's even a picture of him laying down with his mouth open there that, uh, they only want 20 bucks for that? Shit. Well, I guess it's about what it costs to make that. Hey, that's actually a good segue. So <laughs> I got a lot of stuff going on. One of the things, that was a pretty good segue. Thank you, Jason, is um, the uh, the knockoff toys that I've made for the inkmirrors.com collectible line. Uh, they seem to be doing pretty well. And so I've had to order some more components to make some more. So I, I hope I'm going to be uh, being a Santa's elf, a little toy maker here throughout the winter season and, and making more of those. I'll be at Halloween of Palooza. Unfortunately, I cannot be at the Rocky Horror Picture Show stuff. That's the one thing that sucks about us living so far apart is there's a lot of one-day events. Like yesterday, you guys were at the drive-in. I would have loved to be there. Brian, you were at the Orpheum for the Wolfman the day before that. I would have loved to be there, but I just can't drive six, seven hours for a you know a few-hour event, which is kind of silly. So let's see. After Halloween, the week after Halloween of Palooza. So now we are talking Saturday, October 15th. I've got a one-day show in Lansing. And then after that, Scarefest, the weekend of October 21st, 22nd, and 23rd. I'm going to be down there. I'm super excited about this show. I've referenced it quite a bit. I've never been. From what I understand, it's absolutely massive. And this show is pretty much going to close out my convention season. So you were talking... Brian, about the thing on the big screen. I just shared on social media earlier this morning, I think, or last night, I found out that in Howell, Michigan, which is about an hour north of where I'm at, they, uh, and I don't have the date in front of me, but they're doing a um, a 12-hour horror movie marathon, just back to back to back to back. I shared it to a friend of the show, our friend Brian Hoover from Michigan, who likes to support us and ask questions because he is a giant children shouldn't play with dead things fan. Apparently, that's like the 50th anniversary. So they're going to be showing that on the big screen. Same like you just said, how do you not go see that? So I might try to figure out. I got to check the date and see if I can slip up there and at least catch that. I, I don't think I could be there for the, the 12 hours. But what else is going on? A couple other things. Um as of this recording, I am still in the face of horror voting competition thing. Uh, I've gotten some tremendous support from you guys and, and a whole bunch of other people from uh, from the different bubbles in my life. I appreciate it, everything. Um, so yeah, check into my social, which is facebook.com slash corpse barn. And I've been doing daily vote reminders, trying to keep it entertaining with fun pictures and videos and stuff like that. So I'm not just like every day going vote, vote, vote. So uh, yeah, by the time you hear this, Hop over to facebook.com slash corpse bar and see if that's still going on. If I'm still in the running and toss me a free daily vote, I appreciate it. And lastly, the last episode we recorded, I told you that I'm working on something big that there's no way in hell I can tell you about. And all I can tell you right now is it's kind of moved on to phase two. So I still can't tell you about it, but I'm getting really excited to be able to tell you about this. Actually, as soon as I get a couple emails back, then I'll be able to tell you about it. So hopefully by the next episode, I'll be able to blurb my, my news and uh, I think it's pretty damn exciting for the show and for Ink Mirrors and, and just for me personally as a fan. So lots of stuff going on. Oh, wait, there's also Halloween. We got Halloween coming up, fellas. This month? Yeah. We got to fit that in too. Even in Budapest? Probably <laughs> sort of. I, I don't know. No, they don't They don't have it in Budapest, but they have it in Hungary. So That must be where they just, where they, hey, we're hungry, so we want candy. That's how that all started. I get it. Yeah. You learn something new every day. Boy, we are kind of like the Munsters, huh? We're like the lowbrow, aren't we? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now that we know what we're up to, where we're going to be, so Jason doesn't have to stalk us because we'll just tell him where we're going to be. Thanks for listening to the show. Check us out on our socials. I like it. Spooky Horror Podcast on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at I like it underscore spooky i didn't have to edit that one three times in a row baby <laughs> Woo. i hope you guys have a good week and we hope you enjoyed the monsters and if not don't unfriend us or unfollow us on social media take care <laughs> bye bye <laughs> oh you took the words from my mouth about the don't delete us thing Hey, what's wrong with you, man? Show some fucking respect for the dead, will ya?